So welcome everybody to our second in this series. Um, I talked a little bit about the project last week, and so I'm not going to repeat that, but if you would like to know about the project that these webinars are coming out of, you can watch last uh, week's webinar. The webinar series is um, throughout uh, January and February, so there's there are upcoming ones on different aspects of breeding programs, and today we are talking about how to get the best parents into your breeding program. So what we discussed last week was deciding why you want a new variety, what your uh, objectives are in, in determining kind of what kind of project you want to take on. And so one of the first steps in actually starting that project is deciding which parents you want to use as the basis for your new uh, breeding pro project. So deciding on the best parents can be can sometimes feel overwhelming because there's a lot out there uh, in terms of diversity in your crop and also different sources of varieties that you could use as parents. I think that in a lot of ways, it helps the more you can narrow your goals to something that's fairly concrete. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't go for very long term or uh, significant changes in the crop in a breeding program. We need those long-term efforts too, but the more you can define how you want to get there, the easier it is to kind of narrow down onto some of the best parents. So uh, if you have a goal um, and a variety that maybe has some aspects of that goals that you want to say, um, beat one variety for yield and another variety for flavor and another variety for disease resistance, you have kind of those benchmarks of what is the best variety out there for each of those traits. You want to make sure not to choose too many traits because that will really slow down the breeding program at the beginning. And if you're just starting, you probably want to choose something that's relatively concrete and only has a few things that you're changing in order to get the feel of it, and then you can make your breeding program more complex as you get uh, more experience. One thing that is useful is to understand whether the traits that you're interested in are likely to be controlled by one or a few genes or by many genes. So for some things like color or the shape of fruit and some disease resistances, you really have a few genes that are controlling that. And so you need to go find a parent that has those particular genes for that trait. You're not necessarily going to get to where you want to go by selecting within an existing population just because that variation, those genes don't exist in that base population that you might be starting with. You have to go find the particular uh, varieties or wild relatives that might have that particular trait. For other, gene, for other traits like yield or flavor or stress tolerance, it's much, um, there, there are many more genes that control those. And so you want to start with quite a bit of diversity and you can make gradual progress over time towards that, towards that uh, trait continually improving yield, for example, or flavor. Um, this isn't you know, categorical. There's a lot of traits that are kind of in the middle that are controlled by several or many genes, but not uh, quite as many as yield. But it, it kind of helps whether to know whether you're going for a trait that you might find one accession in a gene bank, for example, that will confer that trait onto your new population, or whether you're really gonna need to combine a lot of different sources and then gradually improve something like yield in your particular environment. To understand this, it helps to talk to other breeders look online, look uh, potentially in you know, people's um, published blogs or articles, and then talk to people that are actually working on that crop with some of the traits that you're interested in to understand whether crossing two parents will get you something rather predictable, like in our Juliet by Blush cross, we got a lot of diversity, but we could see where those, you know, different categories came from between the red Juliet variety and the orange blush variety. Um, or whether, like in the case of potato, when you cross two parents, you might get something completely different than either parent. Uh, and so talking to breeders that have a, a more experience in the crop is a good way to kind of know what your expectations should be. Um, finally, 
what the rest of this webinar is really going to talk about some of the nuts and bolts of how to actually get those varieties. Looking at existing ones is good to see what, whether they have some of the traits. The closer the variety is to what you actually want to end up with, the easier it is. So it's easier to use an existing variety than to go to a gene bank accession that maybe has a great source of disease resistance, but everything else is not really adapted to your environment. Um, so you have to make these choices, whether you, you know, search out commercially available varieties or whether you need to go to germplasm resources. Sometimes the germplasm resources have some really fun traits and sometimes they're really hard to work with. So you kind of need to weigh that. Um, for example, here, the hazelnut uh, project I'm working on, we have American hazelnut that has really great disease resistance. And then we have a choice of some that also have maybe better nut quality characteristics and some that have really tight husks that are really hard to harvest no matter what you do. And so we can choose the ones that are closer to what we want for other traits while we're still bringing in that disease resistance. And again, talking to other breeders is a really good way to find out what exists, what's available and what you might want to use. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Paulina. Um, hi everyone, my name is Paulina Jenny. Um, see, I'm having trouble, oh, there it goes, okay. Uh, my name is Paulina Jenny. I'm a research coordinator at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, previously, I was working for Organic Seed Alliance on a project that was looking to understand seed grower perspectives on intellectual property rights. And I'm gonna talk more about that project um, in a couple of weeks. But today I'm gonna to talk about both accessing germplasm from the germplasm resources information network and about the types of intellectual property restrictions you might see on varieties that you're looking to include in your breeding projects. Um, so in order to do that, I'm just going to combine the two topics and talk about the types of IPR you might encounter when searching the grant. But if you have more in-depth questions about either of those particular topics, uh, please feel free to drop those in the chat. So what is the grant? Um, the Germplasm Resources Information Network is a web server that provides access to the National Plant Germplasm System, which is a repository of over half a million accessions of plant material that includes crop varieties, um, land races, and wild relatives. The MPGS was started by the U.S. government in the late 1800s to collect plant material from around the world in order to find the plants that are most suited to um, further the agricultural goals of the United States. But today, um, the GRIN provides seed for free to researchers and breeders around the world who are interested in learning more about the diversity of plants in the system and also screening the accessions for useful traits they might use in their breeding projects. Um, and according to a recent um, State of Organic Seed report, the GRIN is the single most important source of germplasm for public breeding projects in the US. So it's really cool. And even if you aren't planning on using accessions from the grain in your projects, I would definitely recommend just clicking around and exploring what's there. Um, so I'm going to walk through a couple of the features of the website, which has been recently redesigned. So if you've used it in the past, it might look a little bit different. Um, and we're just gonna do a couple of searches and see what's here. So I live in Southeast Arizona and someone in a conversation recently told me that she was growing cowpeas in her garden here. And I wanted to see if there were any cowpeas in the green system that might be good for a breeding project here in the high desert. Um, so I just typed in cowpea to the search bar and my initial search returned over 500 results, which is way too many to really sort through. Um, so I decided to narrow down my search by clicking this advanced search tab. And here I clicked in cowpea and then narrowed my search down to Arizona in the United States. And this time my search just returned this one result. Um, and so I clicked on the accession link to pull up the page for that particular variety, which is there on the far left. And usually the first thing I do when this comes up is to click this passport tab, um, which tells you a little bit more about where the accession came from. So the source history notes here say that the accession was collected in 1966 on the Papago Indian Reservation, which is now the Tona Atom Reservation. Um, and here I just want to note that while the MPGS is 
extraordinarily useful for plant breeders and definitely a vital source of germplasm for seed growers who might have been dispossessed of their um, agricultural traditions over the past century and a half. Uh, a lot of the varieties in the MPGS, especially that were collected earlier on, were collected without uh, the permission of the people who are stewarding them. And there are myriad ways that indigenous people relate to and connect with seed and it's um, Incredibly important to be mindful of that when considering a breeding project that includes indigenous plant material in the MPGS. So that's not necessarily a formal form of IPR, but definitely something to consider. Um, I also want to note that the observation tab here um, is a really good source of information for traits that might not be in the source history or in the narrative, but um, I'm not gonna go too far into that today because Nate Kleinman, who is an actual plant breeder from the Experimental Farm Network has a really good video tutorial on that that we're gonna share with you. Okay, so let's look at another search. Um, I would, so here I just went back to the homepage and I typed in cowpea and drought tolerance in quotes. Um, you can also, I think, you can do this with different disease resistances or pest resistances or other phenotypes you're looking for. Um, and I think you can also do this in the advanced search tab to search specific fields, but this seems to work just as well. So this search returned quite a few more results. So in this case, I clicked on an accession from Nigeria and in the narrative box, I see that this particular cow peak grows well in the Sahel. So I'm thinking it might be interested interesting to try out in the desert um, that I live in. And I notice here also that the IPR tab is uh, clickable. So I'm going to look at that. And in this case, the IPR notes say that the variety was published as a crop science registration, which is an academic repository. Um, and varieties that are published in the Journal of Plant Registrations are often described as being publicly released. And registration requires that the breeder makes a deposit in the MPGS. Um, so this likely means that it's okay to use this variety in a breeding project, but it would be a good idea to check with the authors to make sure that it's not covered by any other forms of IPR. So I looked at the paper um, and this says that the breeders are not planning on seeking intellectual property rights for this variety, but they do ask that um, users of these lines make appropriate acknowledgement of the source. Um, so let's just look at a couple others. This is another cowpea that has a plant variety protection certificate. Um, which means that the variety at the time of the deposit was considered new, uniform, and stable by the Plant Variety Protection Office in the USDA. Um, and while the Plant Variety Protection Certificate is active, it likely will not be available in the grin, but it should be available commercially. So if you're interested in the traits that you see for a particular variety, but it's covered by a PVP, you can probably get it from the company that bred it. Um, and those certificates expire after 20 years. So um, at this point, this one expired in 2001. And so it's free to use in breeding and anyone can commercialize this variety without changing it. Um, here's an example of a potato in the NPGS that has an active utility patent. Um, so the utility patent is granted by the Patent and Trademark Office and not by the USDA, and it prevents anyone from making, using, or selling that invention at all for a period of up to 20 years. So that means it's not okay for research and breeding until after the patent is expired. Um, and that's not available for, for the NPGS either, but it's likely in here because it has a plant variety protection certificate as well. Um, so that kind of seems like a lot, but I want to say that I specifically looked for accessions that were covered by IPR, um, and most of the accessions in the grant are not. Um, so in general, it's a really good source of germplasm for breeding projects, and lots of the varieties that you know and love probably originated here. Um, and you definitely shouldn't feel like you need to memorize all of the legal restrictions in order to use seeds from the grant in your breeding projects. A really good simple rule of thumb is if you aren't sure if you can use the seeds to just connect with the person, breeder, or company that it came from. Um, and many plant breeders are quite community oriented and supportive and will be really happy to hear from you, as I'm sure lots of folks on this webinar can attest. Um, but if you're interested in more details about the different types of IPR, the Organic Seed Alliance put together a really good resource that we will also share in the chat. 
And so finally, I don't want to leave without checking out. So here's my shopping cart. You'll note here that this is where it's going to ask for your statement of purpose. So you need to type in what your intentions are with the seed that you're requesting. And um, then you're on your way. So that's all I have for today. But please feel free to reach out with any questions or drop them in the chat. All right, uh, up to me now. And um, thank you everyone uh, for having me in the webinar today and good afternoon. Um, I'm really excited about the number of people who are increasingly interested in plant breeding. And um, this is a great opportunity for me to share a few resources and considerations that uh, you might find helpful as an independent breeder. Um, let's see, I'm gonna advance the slide. Hopefully that'll work. Okay, great. Um, just to start out, I wanna give a little bit of quick info about who I am for context behind my own personal experiences and how those have shaped the perspectives that I'm gonna to bring to this webinar series. I do have formal training as a plant breeder from UW-Madison, but I don't want anybody in this audience to think that that is the track you have to go down to be a plant breeder. The only real pre prerequisite for being a plant breeder is an interest in being creative with plants and letting that passion lead you to explore and experiment. Thankfully, today there are a lot of um, different resources and communities of people that you can connect with um, and learn about thanks to places just like OSA um, that weren't available when I was just getting interested in plant breeding. So I've been a com I was a commercial breeder for seven years at Johnny Selected Seeds, uh, working on tomatoes and peppers. I gained a lot of uh, really practical hands-on experience uh, in that role, mostly developing hybrid varieties, but also working um, to create new open pollinated varieties and on some open pollinated cleanup projects that were really fun. The photos on this slide uh, represent all the different tomatoes and pepper varieties that I helped trial, breed, and release as of this year. Um, so after that experience, I also served as the executive director um, at Seed Savers Exchange for two years. It's another great nonprofit with some really valuable resources that I'll talk about today um, that could support you in your work as an independent plant breeder, both seed saving educational resources, as well as access to some really unique varieties that you might find useful in your breeding projects. Um, what am I up to currently? Um, I'm doing some seed advisory and plant breeding consulting work um, that includes advising um, some nonprofits who are interested in uh, knowing how that they can further support the work of independent plant breeders, um, also managing a crossing block for an independent tomato breeder. Um, I've started recently volunteering for the OSA Board of Directors, and I just am really excited about work like this that they're doing. Um, and additionally, I have a few pretty small seed saving and breeding projects of my own that I'm working on just for fun at home. All right, so this is the first in three webinars that I'm uh, participating in in this series. Uh, today, I just wanna highlight a few things I've learned along the way, but this is just one set of perspectives. You're gonna develop your own personal breeding philosophy and hone that at, over time with experience. And um, your approach is gonna depend on your own values and objectives. But to start out, here's a quick summary of the topics that I'm gonna review in this webinar. I'm going to talk about how to access heirloom and open pollinated varieties in the Seed Savers Exchange collection, which is a public access seed and plant bank. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, ways that I've worked with uh, breeding material from public plant breeders at land grant universities and talk about some considerations that you'll want to be mindful of when you're looking for new sources of breeding material. Okay, so in addition to seed catalogs and the USDA GRIN system, Seed Savers Exchange is a really great resource for looking for starting material. Um, beyond the catalog that you might be familiar with that has about 600 or so different uh, varieties that you can purchase, they also steward a really large collection of over 20,000 culturally, regionally, and historically significant varieties. Um, this is a really unique and underutilized resource for plant breeders. Um, their collection focuses on preserving America's garden heritage. And unlike um, the USDA GRIN system, this is accessible to anyone in the public. Um, you can access over 6,000 of those 20,000 varieties through their exchange, which I'll talk more about in the next slides. 
Um, but I highly recommend exploring this resource, especially if you're interested in culinary traits or adaptations that maybe uh, were necessary before the widespread use of synthetic fertilizers, chemical inputs, mechanization, refrigeration, long distance transportation, all the modern era dependencies that we've come to rely on. So the exchange is um, the name for the seed sharing platform that Seed Savers Exchange created upon its founding in 1975. So this is where you can find information about what varieties are available through their collection. Um, but you can also uh, network with hundreds of other gardeners and seed savers that they help connect with this resource. Um, this is where you could find, um, sorry, let me back up. Uh, seed Savers has a preservation team and they work really hard along with people in the Seed Savers Exchange community to maintain these varieties, increase these varieties, evaluate them, research their histories and write descriptions for um, the exchange that help make the collection more available. So there are two primary ways that you can uh, access the exchange. Uh, there, one is in print and one is online. Um, to request the print resource, you can go on their website and purchase it for $20 to help cover the cost of printing and shipping. Or if you become a member at the $50 level or greater, um, you can get a free copy of it on request. Um, if you want to ex access it online, you can do so for free at the exchange.seedsavers.org website. Um, the only thing you have to do is just register to be able to log in and start searching. So membership is not required to access this resource. Um, they wanted to make sure it was available to as many people who could use it as possible. Um, but doing so really does help the organization support um, the collection stewardship and sharing. So the exchange yearbook is the print format. That's the original format um, that Seed Savers released and they continue to do it to this day. It's an annual print directory that lists Seed Savers and the varieties they steward. It is the holy grail for garden and plant nerds like myself. It's a huge phone book like directory of plants and plant people. Um, the current 2023 yearbook I believe is being printed and shipped as we speak. Um, it's really not a very fancy um, resource compared to like the slick seeded catalogs that you're familiar with. Um, it's just written descriptions, no pictures, organized by crop type variety, but it's still a really great resource. And varieties that are um, available through the Seed Savers Exchange collection are listed under their listing ID, which is I-A-S-S-E-H-F just stands for the fact that they're in Iowa and it's the Seed Savers Exchange Heritage Farm. So they're gonna make uh, varieties available whenever they have enough seed to distribute it. And it's not available through other gardeners with a few exceptions. Uh, more information about what varieties are available uh, or about the varieties that are available might be, uh, might exist but maybe hasn't made it into this yearbook. So if there's ever anything that you're looking for or you need help searching, um, I put the email here for who to contact if you need some help. And then just really quickly, um, the Exchange website, that's kind of the newer format, not brand new, but relatively new in the organization's history. It still has quite a few kinks uh, to work out, but it is a web-based format, a paperless alternative, and it has some basic searching and filtering options. I find it a good complement to the yearbook because it can help you look for rare varieties. It can help you look for listings by region, um, and it can help you see if there are varieties with images or photos that you might find useful. Unfortunately, it's really not as user-friendly um, or functional as the GRIM database that um, Paulina showed, um, but hopefully it'll improve someday with enough interest and support and help from skilled folks who can uh, help improve that. Another great resource I've had personal experience with that I think independent plant breeders would benefit from are public plant breeders at land-grant universities. So the mission at Land Grant Universities is really to focus on practical agricultural research 
that solves challenges or creates opportunities in their regions. And I found that this is an excellent way uh, to access new and improved breeding materials that have traits sometimes coming from crop, crop wild relatives that would be really difficult to work with, but somebody's already done the hard work of incorporating it uh, into more adapted or cultivated backgrounds. So um, when I was a, a plant breeder at Johnny's, uh, I was able to get some really significant sources of disease resistance, like early blight, late blight, and septoria leaf spot um, from universities like North Carolina State, Cornell, Penn State University. Um, I was also getting some really unique quality traits from uh, these public plant breeders like high lycopene or high anthocyanin types from uh, places like Penn State and Oregon State University. So the, the thing about universities is they all operate independently. So they're all gonna have their own processes that you're gonna need to navigate. Um, and most of them are gonna require some sort of signing of a contract that outlines um, how you can use the material. Typical contracts that you're gonna encounter would be material transfer agreements or MTAs and licensing and seed production agreements if you end up commercializing something with that material. So I just recommend researching who is out there, um, connect with them to learn more about what materials they might have and how to get permission to use it. All right, so I think some other things to be aware of are just different intellectual property you might encounter. I'm not really gonna go into the specifics of this because Paulina did a really good job of uh, putting together that resource that you can access. But these are some of the ones that um, I feel like are pretty likely to be encountered. It's not an inclusive list. It's just practical representation from my own experience. Um, unfortunately, the info about if a variety has protection is just really not always easily available. So if you're in doubt, you really may want to carry out some of your own due diligence research uh, to make sure that you're not violating any laws or cultural boundaries. Um, I'm not aware of any official checklist or like a central resource, but some resources that I've found helpful through the years are, are listed here on this slide. Um, but even after checking those out, sometimes you're still left wondering. Um, and I guess this just gives you some assurance that you've done what you can with the information that you have available. Another thing to be aware of when requesting materials from less formal sources is seed etiquette. Uh, that's requesting from individuals or communities like through the exchange. There are no universal rules of engagement, um, but there are some practices that I would recommend uh, when requesting seeds. So identify yourself as a plant breeder, be open and transparent about your intentions to use that material in research and breeding, um, and ask for permission to use it in any terms that they might have for using it. Um, I think you just got to go into it understanding that there are a lot of different seed philosophies and someone may not want you to use the material for your breeding or commercial purposes. And another important topic to think really carefully about at the beginning of your project when sourcing the material is benefit and credit sharing. So, even though um, your variety may be years away from being finished, you don't really know if it's gonna have a lot of commercial potential or not, you don't want to not think about this and then hit a roadblock in the future after you've done all that hard work. So it's really good to consider and negotiate um, what that looks like upfront so that you don't have any surprises, misunderstandings, things that could delay, um, or compromise a release or even just completely stop it in its tracks. Um, in my experience with working from working with breeding materials from independent breeders, universities, other seed companies, a five to 10% royalty structure is most commonly negotiated, but I've seen different ones depending on the situation. Um, sometimes the royalties are also structured around the percent of material in the pedigree of a commercialized variety. So um, that would include the derivatives, not just what is created by directly using the material. Um, so when you are ready to release, you may or may not wanna keep that pedigree info secret. 
But either way, it's just a really good practice to acknowledge any source that was significant uh, in your breeding work, especially if it would help the success of the source. Um, so for example, um, some of the varieties that I helped release at Johnny's, um, like Valentine, Citrine, and Abigail, um, we made sure to credit the university and public breeders in our catalog descriptions, in addition to giving them royalties. Um, and then there are just really interesting new bottles of voluntary benefit and credit sharing that are emerging on the seed landscape, uh, especially as efforts to acknowledge and compensate Black, Indigenous, and people of color um, for their contributions, which have historically been ignored or exploited by the seed industry. So some good examples of these can be found on the Fedco website, Fedco Seeds, um, uh, where they're providing some indigenous royalties and doing some black benefit sharing. So with that, I just wanna say thank you. Um, I hope it's given you some good practical food for thought. Um, have fun creating, happy to answer questions or give you advice or project support. Um, and I hope to see you again in the upcoming webinars. And here we go. Hi, so uh, Michael Mazurek, uh, I'll be talking to you about material transfer agreements or the, the, the paperwork section of this. Um, so I'm going to be telling you some things based on my experience. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, this is free, so that should tell you the, that part. Uh, but also, you know, there's a lot that you uh, you should really get checked out by a legal professional if you think that's important, right? Also, uh, just so you know some of my background, uh, I was a co-founder of Row 7 Seeds. I'm on the board of directors of the Open Source Seed Initiative, Aussie. We all know that it is uh, uh, concerned with seed freedoms, not seed, not uh, intellectual property restrictions. Um, I'm a plant breeder at Corn Cornell University, and also I'm an independent plant breeder at things that are outside of what Cornell has me do. And so as we get into MPAs, um, I wanted to go through a little softly into the introduction, uh, knowing that uh, for uh, some people, uh, maybe some people in the audience uh, today especially, uh, you know, an MTA is a four-letter word about how we manage uh, plant intellectual, well, what we do with seeds, right? So I wanted to start off with one of the most important things is the key thing here is it's about communi communicating. It is about writing down uh, what your expectations are and really thinking about what those expectations are when you share things, right? Um, so the reason why it's important, and there's a lot of other ways to do it besides just the formal rigid legalese MTA, um, is just throughout life, you probably had these experiences that memories fade, right? Uh, sometimes people make assumptions like, yeah, you're going to give them that scratch off lottery ticket in their birthday card. And if they hit it big, no, they're good. They're, of course, they're going to share some with you, et cetera. Um, people turn over at a, an organization you're dealing with. Your contact might not be the same, right? So if you go to your late neighbor's estate sale and you see your lawnmower leaving that you loaned them years ago, right? So uh, it's gone, right? It's always easier to do stuff beforehand, right? Uh, it's a thing, and it ties to the next thing, anticipate wild success. Uh, the plant breeding process takes a while. Whenever we're looking at doing some new adventure and some participatory plant breeding project with a grower or even on breeding programs, it's like you just have this whole adventure ahead of you, and it's really easy just to be thinking about that process. Uh, but then when you get there, have you planned uh, to pack what you need when you get there? So it's a thing I always do. It usually feels a little weird, but it's an important thing to do is to, to stop and hit the awkward space and say, okay, so if this succeeds wildly, if we have this, the most successful variety of this crop ever in the world, or it's like amazing, how do we, uh, like, are we going to feel differently about it then? Uh, it's going to be sold. Uh, is going to be transferred. Other people are going to grow it. Other growers are going to grow it. Like, how do you envision success? That turns out to be key, I think, right? And also being thoughtful about what you sign. I plant breeding. There's a science and there's an art to it. I pay a lot of attention of how other artists in other industries uh, kind of figure out, like, what their creative uh, space and what they've done and how it gets shared. 
So Prince uh, is known for having some influential thoughts that helped a lot of other artists or in hindsight revealed stuff to artists. Uh, so Prince's quote is, if you don't own your masters, your masters own you, which is uh, he had some uh, harsh thoughts for the recording industry, but also in terms of uh, so he's going to do master recordings. If you, you never want to give away your rights to be able to continue and work with your art. Um, that's the thing that comes up over and over, uh, I find, right? And especially as people are just starting out, uh, the struggling artist starting out, you really have to think about what would you as a successful artist want? So uh, Prince has some good advice. Uh, uh, you can see some recent things where people are also learning that in the recording industry. Right. Okay. So in the end, what really you need is some form of documentation that forces you to work through all the details, work through it with another person, make sure you're on the same page, think of everything you can. Right. So for documentation, often, uh, especially if it's something that, you know, you don't is going to be like not proprietary. I've used something like this for material I have from the public domain. If I have an heirloom I want to give to someone I know is at a seed company, uh, I usually have a letter that just says, hey, uh, as far as I know, this is in the public domain. I'm going to uh, share this with you. Uh, and um, you, you shouldn't really do anything that would restrict anybody else's ability to work with this. Right. Uh, and I wait for a reply uh, and then we'll, we'll share it. Right. Uh, so there's a variety of letters. There's one in the, this first link below. If you'd like to see an example letter um, that uh, the National Institute of Health suggests people use, for example. Right. There's also formal contracts. I'm going to go through that, spend a little while. Uh, uh, for one, that is just a widespread blanket agreement and people sign up if they're going to uh, agree to the terms. A lot of universities do this. Uh, institutions, they have a, a UBMTA, Uniform Biological MTA, right? So it's a good starting point. And if you want to take a look at this, uh, you can see basically a generally uh, useful MTA that a lot of other people's material transfer agreements look really similar to, right? Uh, the link I provided here that I think will be available uh, afterwards is their draft where they're still discussing a little bit. You can also search around and find final ones that are formatted really pretty. This one looks like it's off a dot matrix printer, but it gets you all the details. And also you can see what people are thinking about and some criticisms of this, right? Uh, also, uh, if you are thinking about structures to incorporate benefit sharing, et cetera, um, uh, the FAO has a standard MTA uh, that's also interesting and that downloads as a PDF, right? And one of the things, even if you work out something with uh, someone you know at a seed company, it's really important how that's communicated within the seed company. Or if the material is coming into my breeding program where someone has some expectations for what I will or will not do with it, um, I'll sign something. Uh, the university signs something. You got to make sure it's someone that has signature authority. Otherwise, it might not count. Um, right? But so then... Uh, you know, I often hand it off to the team that's doing some of the seeding in the greenhouse. Uh, they might, ooh, get excited about it and want to share with their friends. Maybe that's not allowed. You have to label the seed packets so that uh, the people actually working with the seed know what people in the office uh, have negotiated. Right? So what's typically an MTA, right? There's a lot. Not all of this is in every MTA. Um, but uh, this is like the sum total of what I've seen. I've been uh, interacting with MTAs in all those capacities for over 20 years. Uh, I've been interacted with about a thousand of them probably all together. Uh, so I can kind of summarize what I've seen in wearing all those hats, right? So there's always a recipient and provider. So that's just the who's who. There'll be some aspects of this that might raise some clarity sometimes. You want to know. Uh, if uh, like kind of who all is involved, this is a great way to do that. And the material. And so this is the actual, the, the seed you're going to share, right? And this is legalese. All I'm using is like the legal jargon you'll see on that NIH uh, MTA or others. Uh, so I'm not saying seed are just things. I'm just going to be uh, saying how they use it. Uh, I was surprised when people drill holes in beans to make necklaces. I'm not cool with that. So I don't view the seeds as just things. I'm going to use the le legal terms right now, right? 
Uh, you might have an agreement that's uh, for propagation or a non-propagation agreement as a trial, right? So this is important. Uh, this is something that we've had to pay attention to as I have previously just released lots of breeding material at whatever stage. We started to have issues where we found people were making sub-selections from something that wasn't all the way true breeding. Uh, we started to have uh, multiple selections from something that was all maybe the same, maybe different. We have to do a lot of detective work to really figure out what's the same or different from that. So uh, we've had to learn to be careful about how we communicate if something is ready to be put into production, uh, propagation, or whether it's something where we're just providing a, a sample for someone to look at the trial agreement, non-propagation agreement. Uh, some MTAs have an expectation of returning the data back. Um, so if you're going to be collecting data, uh, sometimes the, the provider wants to know. Uh, there's also some things they might add about where will this be planted? Can I come and check on it? So uh, some of those have turned up, right? Uh, usually every MTA has a statement about liability. The idea is, and this is especially important if you're just sharing seed with others and you want to have some expectations, uh, an indemnification clause. So if they do something with it uh, that they shouldn't have, or if it has a disease you didn't know about, or you know, a release of liability is, is standard. Right? Different uh, MTAs have different uh, expectations for transfer. Can you give it to anyone else? Or is the only way it kind of makes it out uh, is if it's like commercially sold? Like, so can you give it to others? Um, Right. The commercialization. So this is, uh, uh, Emily uh, did a great job mentioning this. Uh, so uh, if something is going to be commercialized, uh, is there an expectation of some benefit sharing? Uh, uh, and if so, I suggest you get an idea of that up front before you make your crosses with it. Say, hey, please uh, let's set like the scope of what you think about uh, is a fair rate. You get that in writing, maybe get a sample license. Uh, figure out, fi figure those deals out, plan for the success at the end, right? Uh, the transfer, commercialization, et cetera, uh, they'll be really affected by two other terms, whether you have an unmodified derivative, that means you're as is, you get a variety, you like it, you want to sell it or hand out the seed swap, um, unmodified derivative. If you're going to do crosses with it, um, and make selections, um, then you have a modified derivative. There are different aspects that will affect like what, whether you can transfer, commercialize it, et cetera, right? Uh, for patents, most MTAs have a patent line. I'm not advocating for patents here, but usually it says the, the, the person that's providing it has the right to patent it. Uh, it might say the recipient does or does not have a right to patent something they do with it. You want to look at that. Um, it will affect your relationships with the, the friends you're sharing seed with the other uh, parties, right? And also look at expiration, termination, survival. Uh, these show up, right? So this is all not super exciting. However, you want to pay attention to these details. Otherwise, later on, you can get some bad exciting uh, mixed into your breeding program, right? So expiration. So are you going to try this for a year? Are you going to try this for 20 years? Is it for eternity, right? So how long does this apply for, right? If you want to terminate it, if someone decides, no, I don't want to work with this anymore, um, you've made a bunch of crosses with it, at, at what point have you like then spread this all through your breeding program and decide, no, I don't want to continue that? So what happens then? Uh, do you have to throw out all that seed? Etc. Uh, there's also terms that you always survive past the end of agreement, such as the liability clause always carries on, right? So not an exciting list, a whole bunch of legalese. These are the words you'll see in all capitals on all these MTAs. Um, but these are still some important things to know. And I can talk about how these might play into your decisions uh, to work with material, or if you do think that these are key to some expectations you have of someone working with your material, right? There are also uh, ones that you, uh, agreements you might be um, part of that you might not 
No, at the time. Shrink wrap or click wrap MTAs are common. It's like whenever you download software on your phone, you get a new app, you click, you get a long list of stuff and oh, I'm not going to read all that. I just want to play the game. You click agree. It's whatever. Um, so you're agreeing to someone else's terms and conditions. There's expectations, whether they can share your data, et cetera. Uh, a lot of people are going back and looking. Do I really want to do that? Uh, some ways these show up, bag tag agreements, a shrink wrap agreement, anything you write on a seed packet, contract law, by breaking the seal, you hereby agree to, you won't plant the seed, you won't, I mean, that's, uh, you know, if it's done, it can be legally binding. Um, enclosures, sometimes people put a flyer in, uh, uh, and sometimes there's mis miscommunication. Uh, someone at a seed company is sending you things to make a cross with or a trial, and they accidentally uh, put on the bag tag or put a, fly, a piece of paper in that says, by using this, you hereby agree, you will not trial this, you only use it for production. It's happened uh, to us uh, a couple of times, so we were on the lookout for these. Uh, USDA uh, on the GRIN website is great. And one thing I've noticed, do click on that IPR tab, like Pauline said, because uh, there's some material uh, that's coming internationally. It has this uh, FAO, uh, Standard Material Agreement. Right? So this has clauses about what's allowed for restrictions, expectations for benefit sharing, data that how you'll communicate this to anyone else you want to transfer the seed to. Um, so take a look at it. So if you click and order the seed, you will get, as this says, uh, this added to your contact info is added to the database. Right. So if you want to uh, pay attention to things. Right. So in my breeding program, uh, as new material comes in, we do a really thorough job of accounting for exactly where stuff came from. Right. Everything is a unique identifier. We put it on the packet, any correspondence, background information we keep with it. We retain that seed packet forever once we've crossed with it and go back like 80, 100 years in some of our, our seed vaults here. Um, that is really important because in some cases we need to show that that packet did or did not have a sticker on the back that said, by opening it, we hereby agree. So uh, it's important to keep that. Uh, it will have some good info and they're historical otherwise. Uh, we save the receipt to prove that we did buy it and when we got it and what's for. So it's all key stuff in case there's an issue comes up and someone says, oh, hey, uh, that seed you have, it should have come with this information. Uh, you should have known about this restriction, right? Our breeding records have all the crosses and what accessions they came from. Uh, and uh, in this day and age, I'll point out, um, there's a lot that people will forget they made crosses, either you or people you share things to. Uh, genome sequencing is to the is to the status. It's really cheap. Uh, almost everything we bring into the program, we sequence the stuff that comes out. We have the genome sequence. It's just a little uh, getting CSI on it. It's not changing the genome, but it's taking a look. Uh, so we really get to see the whole pedigree history, uh, whether someone wants to share it uh, explicitly or not. You can still get a pretty good idea. Right. So uh, some parting thoughts. Right. Uh, is, I like this phrasing. It's uh, what a, a person shared with me before. Uh, I, I, I stick with it. Uh, his quote was, don't cozy up to contracts, but writing it down is proper. Right. It's how you communicate. It's how you manage and preserve relationships. Like nothing uh, can be harder on a friendship than uh, if uh, you have a, a business aspect that gets entangled with it. Right. Contemplate success, contemplate the world changes, right? So make sure you're thinking about the end goal. Don't sign up more than you can manage. You wanna avoid a whole bunch of spider webs and signing up for them because they sound okay at the time. As for the license terms up front, as Emily said, you wanna know what does success look like, right? Get advice from people with experience that have gone through this uh, for sure. And again, uh, here uh, Prince comes in with some recording industry advice. Uh, tell me a mu musician that's got rich off digital sales. Apple's doing pretty good though, right? So just be thinking about, and it, it's a thing just, I bring up this time and time I've seen again, where you know, usually kind of the more you're into a thing about a handshake agreement and trusting people, um, it's a thing where, you know, you can look to see what industries are making money off something. Uh, and so you can, 
uh, use that to think about where do you want to protect yourself and look out for yourself, right? And so with that, I'll turn it over to Keith. Thank you for that, Michael. Uh, really appreciate that because not being a business, great business person, that's the kind of information that I really benefit from. So I appreciate that. Um, my name is Keith Mueller, and I'm an independent breeder. I have been for about 30 years. Um, I did background work uh, with Dr. Carl Clayberg on melons and beans, and it kind of jogged my memory listening to this that uh, I did have an interactional experience with the beans. Um, I'll go into that in a second. And um, I worked at the University of North Carolina for Dr. Randy Gardner and got involved in tomatoes. And that's pretty much what I've been doing since that time. Um, so I'm going to go over why uh, my experience with uh, requesting germplasm from international resources, and in particular um, from the Asian Vegetable Research and Development Center, which is now called, I think, um, World Vegetables or Go Vegetables. Um, so it's in Southeast Asia, it's in Taiwan. Um, I've had great success with them. They're great people to work with. This is a little bit of dated information. They've kind of upgraded some of the things that they do now. Um, but um, why I contacted them was I was looking, as Julie said, be very specific for the material that you're looking for to set your goals. And I was looking for very specific material in tomatoes that weren't available from the USDA grin or the Tomato Genetics Resources Center at UC Davis. Um, the, some of this material is a very old material. Um, I learned about it when I was in North Carolina. I was looking originally at bricks and tritratable acidity um, for the flavor compounds. And I, so I did a lot of research on it and I found out about a lot of these lines, but at the time I really couldn't do anything with them. But when I got it on my own, I'm like, I wanna go back and look at those. Um, there were very diverse lines, um, and many of them were species backgrounds or integrated lines, Pimpinella folium to sericiforms in particular. Um, some of them were U.S. lines, um, but they weren't accessible anymore within the USDA. Now, there's different reasons for that. Maybe they were overlapped. Um, and maybe they were used and... Um, nobody wanted to use them anymore or they wanted to pull them because uh, certain companies felt like, well, those are things that we want to use. I don't know, but I couldn't get them anymore. And um, I found some of them referenced in uh, Asian research papers more uh, frequently, more, more often in that time period I started looking. Um, so I went that angle and that brought me on to AVDRC. Um, this, this is an example of segregation from one of the crosses that I did um, from that high bricks material. And you can see quite a variation. This is actually an F3. Um, so the easiest way to access material internationally now, I believe, is the Genesis program. And you can go to their website and do this tutorial to help you. It looks a lot or it looks similar to what um, was shown earlier in the GRIN search. And um, I just suggest you go there and follow the instructions. Um, it's, it's pretty easy. Um, this is, I didn't do it that way when I received this. This goes back to 2008 and I received the material in 2009. Um, I just, through their website, I contacted them and their database at that time looked a lot like um, the USDA GRIN does now. They had a lot more identifiers within their um, the database, so that was interesting. It allowed me to look at material more closely uh, for what I was looking for and find things I didn't know about. But this is what I received after I'd contacted them. Um, and you may have to contact some gene banks, seed banks, um, separately from the Genesis system. It just depends on whether they're funding, if they're involved in that or not. Um, but um, what I received was this airmail package with foil wrapped things. There was no agreement on these uh, envelopes like Michael was talking about. But, um, you know, I, I got a letter, a packing letter saying, you know, this is what we've contained in it, um, a checklist, 
um, for what was in it again and a phyto sanitary certificate down there in the bottom left and um, they did all that which was nice um, because if you send it back to the material you may have to pay for that yourself um, that was not part of this agreement with these seeds they were older things so they weren't worried about that but um, there's forms for the ipr and the mta and basically going over you know hey we we're okay if you share these, but you know, notify the correct people. Um, you can use and the terms for the using it. But what I thought was interesting was that they sent me uh, extra envelopes and an extra MTA in case I sent things back. Now the agreement I had with them was that I would take data and I would send the data back to them about the performance of the varieties. Was it really doing what it was supposed to be doing? Which is I thought was uh, pretty unique. Um, I've tried to do that with USDA and they don't really seem to be interested in getting information back or at least they haven't in the past. Um, I just was going over things and these were covered by other speakers so I'm not really going to go through them and it's just what I talked about. Um, but I would say if you're contacting an international um, resource um, Think about the time zone differences when you're communicating with them. Um, you know, this day and age, we expect people to answer us quickly, but that may not happen. And it remember that when it's your busy season, it may be their down season and vice versa. So you may not always get the response that you want. Um, think ahead, plan ahead on these and um, know that it may take time to get your samples. Um, Currently, I'm seeking stuff from Australia, and um, it was been difficult because the U.S. mail stopped delivering, I think because of COVID, stopped delivering to New Zealand, Indonesia, and Australia. So I believe that's opened back up, so I'm going back into this process and requesting specific material from them again that I can't get here in the United States. It's, it's kind of funny because it's originally from the United States. And it's originally from Florida, but um, seed banks no longer carry it. And I've years ago, I contacted Jay Scott in Florida and he said, yeah, yeah, I'll look at that. And then when he finally got around to it, um, the building that it was stored in was damaged by a tropical storm and uh, had water damage and all those seeds were lost. And I contacted uh, Randy Gardner at uh, North Carolina State and uh, he had the same problem. Uh, really, except their um, power went out in their um, uh, refrigerating unit for the seeds and that, that that was stored in and they didn't know about it for a long time. So the seeds were no good anymore. Um, remember that when you order from people that um, you usually get small samples and you should account for germination and you need a, a, a decent population size, um, especially for outbreeders. So you may have to get the material and increase it yourself. And uh, another point I had about that was um, when you get seeds from seed banks um, in general, um, this has happened to me more often than not. And I, in the past, I used to get excited. Oh boy, I have this. Let's start making crosses right away. And um, I find out that material is not as uniform as I thought. This is an example of um, such a population I grew out uh, what is it, 10 of them there, and you can see that it, it looks like a an F2 or an F3 segregation, um, so you just have to go back and go, okay, which line was most like what the descriptor said it should be, and, and go with that, and hopefully that you've um, either got outliers of route crossing, so um, remember that when you're uh, accessing material that um, you may have to test that population first, and you may have to do things to increase the population to get enough um, to have to do your studies and work. And that's about it, all I had. Okay, thanks so much, Keith. That was great. Um, some really practical advice there. Um, I think we're going to open it up for a question and answer period, and Michael Lorden is going to be moderating the questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A or into the chat, and we'll be reading them out loud for as much time as we have. We have about 30 minutes or so. 
Um, and we did record this webinar in case you came on late and missed that announcement. Um, and we'll be posting the recording within about a week on the eOrganic YouTube channel. And after the webinar, we're going to be sending out a survey sometime this afternoon. And um, we will put a link to the slides in that survey so that you can access those if you want to go back and look at something later or share it with someone else. So um, thank you. And uh, Michael, I'm going to pass it on to you. I'll put the slide back up. Thank you, Alice, and thank you all the presenters. I was uh, I I learned quite a few things, and I'm in this field, so I uh, appreciate all of your presentations. Um, if you have questions, yeah, feel free to put them in the Q and A. Uh, it looks like a lot of our panelists have been kind of responding to the questions through chat as they come in. So while we're waiting for any more to come in here, I can kind of provide a little bit of a recap of some of those questions that people have because I'm sure. Uh, a lot of folks would have similar questions. Um, yeah, and thanks uh, to the question that just came in the chat, if the presenters want to put their email addresses in there um, to be contacted. Uh, so yeah, keep the questions coming. There were some questions about the Seed Savers Exchange ADAPT program, which is a community science trialing system that uses SeedLinked as a platform. And SeedLinked was one of the things we talked about in last week's webinar. Uh, and uh, Emily responded to that question. The question was about whether the data from those trials is available. Um, and Emily suggested that the, you could reach out to exchange at Seed Savers Dot org to get that information. And I believe some of the previous year's trials is also posted on the Seed Savers website, which I'll put the link into the chat right now. Um, that program is really great. They trial a lot of varieties. They have a lot of um, participants in that. Emily, I don't know if you wanted to add anything more about that program that you from your experience. Um, I just I think it is a great resource for people to look into if you are interested in helping um, seed savers trial some of the material that is in their collection. They just have a lot of stuff that um, they really don't know much about. And so every year they try to pick um, certain crops or certain varieties that they can uh, work with the people in the community who grow them out, um, run these really cool participatory trials. In recent years, they've been amping that up with the help of SeedLinked, um, who have this great platform for uh, putting all of the trial information into and sharing that in real time with other people. Um, I'm not quite sure you know, how many people are involved, but I would highly suggest going and checking it out if you're interested in getting involved. All right, thanks. A uh, question in the chat from Ty, are F2 seeds open for plant breeding? So I'm interpreting that as if you have a F1 hybrid, you may not know who the parents are and you save seed from that F1 hybrid. Now you have the F2 generation. Can you use that for plant breeding? Yeah, um, oh, go ahead, Michael. No, I was gonna say, so it, it, it depends on uh, if there is a patent uh, or some other agreement that was there, uh, you, you have challenges. Otherwise, uh, for a PVP, plant variety protection, once you get to the F2 stage and you're doing breeding, you're exempt uh, from that. Uh, also, I like to encourage people uh, to work with those F2s, take F1s that don't have restrictions, patents on them, and cross them together uh, or just self-seed from them. The, one of the biggest challenges uh, that people have with their on-farm breeding project is making that cross. If you get an F1, uh, there's a good, there's a you have something that someone's already done the cross for you. How different those parents were or not, you'll find out. Julie. Yeah, yeah that was like exactly what I was going to say. Oh. Nice. <laughs> Take a like. Sounds good. Uh, since this whole series is kind of about collaborative plant breeding, there's a good question about if you are managing a collaborative trialing program or a collaborative breeding program and you receive material with an MTA, um, do all of the participants in that trial need to also sign that MTA before you distributed that? I think, Michael, you answered that, but if you could elaborate a little. Yeah, no, I think in how, how these are phrased, and I had the, uh, the unexciting paper question. So how these are phrased, it's, it's so usually it's if someone's going to have it under their 
direct supervision under their control. So if it's someone that's going out and like, so I'll plant a trial on a grower's farm and I will harvest it or it's something like it's a cucumber and it's, that doesn't really have all that seed that'd be viable out there. Um, that makes it much simpler. So it doesn't matter as much if they've signed anything um, in that case. Uh, However, uh, you also, you want to avoid a case and we, we encounter it where we share stuff because we want other people to see it. They're excited about it. They give it to their friends. Uh, their friends get a little bit of it. They, they either didn't know or whatever about the MTA. I mean, you just click agree, whatever, ignore that. And then we see our stuff showing up like in seed companies. Uh, uh, there was one time I couldn't get enough trial seed for a colleague to be able to put in his trial. I bought some off eBay. Uh, we finished the trial, right? So on one hand, yeah, the seed freely going around, there's definitely merits to that. Uh, that is kind of the underpinnings of civilization and agriculture is seed is shared and improved, you know, but at the same time, you know, then that goes to a company that then is bought by somebody who patents it and puts by restrictions that prevent stuff. Maybe you wish you had gotten out ahead of that or, you know, you're using it for some benefit sharing. And now that it's out there, the companies that are doing the benefit sharing are a disadvantage to the people that aren't having to return any portion of their for-profit proceeds. So you got to think a little bit bigger about it. Yeah. Yeah, I think too, like sometimes it's possible to modify an M MTA and make it potentially easier for trialing network uh, participants to sign where it's, you know, not um, the two page agreement that you might get from your university office. And as long as everybody agrees on the side that's originating the MTA, that can be one way of dealing with it if they really do want all participants to sign an MTA. Um, one thing we did with the collaborative breeding project is that we submitted our populations or Erica, Keith uh, and OSA submitted the populations we were starting with to the open source seed initiative. And then we send the pledge with them. And so it's not a formal MTA, but it does recognize uh, that they, you know, always should be, everything that is derived from those should be accompanied by that pledge. And so that was, possible because the originating breeders were interested in doing open source and the university agreed to that. And I think that was a good solution for the collaborative nature of the project because so many people are contributing to it, but might not be possible in all cases, depending on where um, the, uh, the original population comes from. And that's, yeah, so seed freedoms, uh, I'm on the board, uh, so <laughs> I advocate for that. You know, well, one of the things in those is I've been part of those too. There's there's also ways we've been able to back up and with some people like say, well, what cross would you like? And then make it for them and then share it. And then the university doesn't uh, consider there's any ownership. No one's done any breeding work, they think on our end. But the other then is even as you have these collaborative networks, you know, I think you still want understandings about, um, when something will be released, when when will some people start to grow it and put it out there? Because you you don't want someone to to kind of jump out and showboat and just take one thing and debut it while everyone's like, hey, buddy, we're still working on this together. So I think you still should figure out expectations, even if you like cannot stomach the legal documents and signing. Yeah, Keith. Yeah, I wanted to mute myself. I wanted to add to that. Um, another way of saying that, what Michael just said is, um, so I release something and I've got it to a certain stage and this is what the goal I'm after is. If it gets out there and, and it's like an F3 or F4, it's still not quite fixed it, um, on an open pollinated line. It's not. And so if somebody releases it as what we're calling it, and then it gets out there and starts spreading around before what I was going after gets out there, then there's two different things out there really, maybe even more. And to me, that's kind of frustrating as a breeder because I had a specific goal and a specific thing I was after. And now that's kind of pulled out from underneath me and people may expect one thing or another. I've already seen that with the lines that I've just like put out there that um, what's in these, uh, C catalogs are offering or not originally what I put out there. 
So a lot of that has to do with seed husbandry, but some of the material are released early to people. And I, I tend not to do that anymore unless it's in a program like this. I would also mention somebody in the chat was asking about pedigrees as a part of the OSSI uh, agreement. I put the pedigrees of the lines I submitted. And so that may be a resource. I don't know if that's, is that, is that the case? Michael, that somebody could look up whatever was submitted and look at the pedigree if they provided it? I'm making sure I'm plugged in here. Okay. Uh, so can you look it up uh, for where? I missed that part. Um, well, I submitted lines to OSSI mm -hmm. and um, I submitted the pedigrees. Can people go online and see those pedigrees? Uh, I, I think so, or it would be... Um, the 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 facts are Aussie just got redone so I think the it, it's all we, usually every variety has an extensive narrative I think in some cases right. it might not all be known but there is a, a narrative section uh, that really encourages people to expand on it uh, but you know some cases uh, there's some crops where um, you know if you're if you're doing apple tree selections or there, there could be cases yeah. where that's kind of a longer term than some of the annuals we're used to working with so i think it, it's going to vary uh some of the narratives feature it prominently other ones there's less information yeah i know that um uh things i've looked at probably around the 70s they really stopped posting um more so the 80s but um they really stopped posting pedigrees at universities um, and things became seem to be get more proprietized. But if you go back in the literature, you can find pedigrees for a lot of older hybrids. Yeah, you know, and I think it's really um, the Journal of Crop Registrations is really good uh, for that. And I'd say um, for uh, PVPs, the plant variety protection, where you just yeah. can't put it in your seed catalog or make a hybrid with it, you can do most anything else with it. Um, those uh, PVP documents, they do, do have some pretty good insight into the breeding process. So when you do get a publication, that's a good way to avoid having your stuff patented too, by the way. Uh, and also uh, the PVP applications do give a lot of really good information. Yeah, that's that's from the USDA. Yeah, I've, I've looked at that before, yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Yep. Yeah, yeah I, I just know. wanted to read, uh, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say also, um, in searching out material with the melons, um, you know, one of the questions I had was was going to uh, uh, Paulina, I believe, um, is a plant variety protection. You know, when it runs out, can you use it? And I actually know the answer to that, but I think other people might have that question um, because I had to chase something down, and I actually went back to a foundation at a university, and and they were like, "What?" <laughs> but they were like, they didn't care at that point. But you should contact if it's in foundations. Uh, you should contact that foundation and see if they want to re-up that plant variety protection. There was a good question in the chat that uh, Julie answers. Person was wondering about um, finding out the parents of an F1 that may have been out of production for many years. And yeah, Julie's good advice about contacting the seed company. They may be willing to share that information if it's been out of production for a while or looking at the PVP application. If it was protected under that way, you may be able to find the parents um, and that a company may even license the inbreds inbred lines uh, if they're no longer interested in carrying that one, although that may, that yeah, situation may be rare. That, that's rare, right? Because often hybrids are a combination of inbred lines that may be used in multiple hybrids. And so the, the company would have to essentially not really be using those inbreds anymore. Um, there were also, I think Emily and Michael just pointed out like journal plant registrations or other publications. Um, also, you can you can talk to other breeders that might have familiarity with it, and they may be able to tell you what they suspect, even if it's not fully known. But it is hard sometimes to figure out what the parents of an F1 hybrid is, because that often is kind of a, a way for the companies to protect that variety if they're not seeking formal IP. Um, and so they may very closely 
guard the identity of the inbreds. And Emily, you can probably talk more about this because Johnny's usually, um, you know, releases hybrids, but doesn't necessarily seek formal IP on those. So they're available for breeding, but they, you know, th their contribution kind of is the, the inbred development to that hybrid and the specific combination. Yeah, that's right. It's just kind of de facto um, IPR in that, you know, the seed company holds the secret of which inbred lines go into the hybrid. Um, I have heard of that, of seed companies licensing their inbreds to other people. I don't have personal experience with that, but um, I guess it's worth looking into if you're looking for something specific. Great. We're going to try to keep answering as many questions as, as we can. I'm getting a lot of good ones here. Um, this one might be a quick one. Does anybody know of any, we, we some of you mentioned contacting the breeder um, if you're interested in a crop. Does anybody know any good uh, experts or references for working with beans? Michael? Yeah, so for beans, uh, yeah, there are some bean breeders. There's actually, it's one of the crops I work with where there's multiples of us. Uh, cucumber is very lonely, uh, but for beans, I think the, there are some plant breeding forums where you have a lot of great independent and freelance plant breeders that really uh, have some remarkable insights that some of the us academic types lack. Uh, it overlaps too, uh, but you'll see there's uh, groups like the Bean improvement uh, cooperative, the BIC. It's a group where there's a lot of the, the bean breeders get together and talk. Um, a lot of uh, freelance people too. Uh, I also work with beans, although uh, I have a, a few years into beans, not decades like some of the other crops. So I still ask my friends for insight. All right. Thank you. Uh, if good question here, a lot of the uh, collections that we're referencing, they often just send you a small sample from 25, 50, sometimes even 10 seeds. So if you're working with an outcrossing crop and you only get about 10 seeds from them, how can you avoid inbreeding depression? Uh, what would be the best strategy for that? No, I think you either have to uh, to cross it with something, get something else that's similar and crosses it, try to build it up, or uh, you got what you got. Uh, you can help uh, keep those 10 seeds alive and intermating. But there's um, one of the reasons why the seed banks want to restrict some of the requests is that they have limited resources. They will actually have to end up genetically bottlenecking a population when they regenerate it to have more seed to distribute. So every time someone requests seed, they're depleting the stockpile, then they regenerate and it bottlenecks again. Some of these, they only had 10 to 50 seeds uh, that they were using in some of the regeneration processes. But uh, that's what, I, what I've seen. I would point out too that the uh, Organic Seed Alliance on their website has a, a good resource for um, determining how large of a population you'll need and what the isolation difference, uh, distance will need for that crop. And it depends on whether they're outbreeders or inbreeders, which don't really want to get into too much, but um, you can find that information there. Um, so sometimes it kind of does help on getting uh, two different resources for that same variety, if if that's possible. Um, but uh, yeah, you definitely need to concern yourself with that. Um, but you know, I'd say from tomatoes, my experience, it's not really an issue. You usually get about fifty seeds. Um, I have requested before from the USDA, um, can you send me more seed? And they usually do, um, as long as it's a reasonable request. Uh, I had the same thing with the melons. Um, when I requested them from Ames, Iowa, I requested a larger sample so that I could get a better population for them. And it was no problem. Just I just had to ask for it. I was just going to mention too that um, if you were to request something from the Seed Savers Exchange collection, they do provide what they have considered enough of a sample for you to maintain um, the integrity of that variety. 
um, since they're, one of their goals is to see people participating in the conservation of things that are in their collection. Um, and just as Keith mentioned, if there's enough distributable inventory and for whatever reason um, you're looking for a larger sample size, it doesn't hurt to ask because they might provide it for you. Also, if, if you ask and they don't have more, um, the best thing to do is not to keep it at a small population size. You want to essentially plant what you've got from them, keep all the seed, and get the population size back up because your risk of losing alleles, like the, the different versions of the genes, increases the more generation something is at a very small population size. So if you don't have any other options, keep all the seed the next generation. And then you can start looking at that and um, you know, seeing how much variation there actually is. You know, if you're getting a small sample, it might have already been bottlenecked. So asking for more may or may not actually give you more diversity. Uh, and then if you're using it in a cross, you're likely not go going to make a cross with hundreds of individuals. So at that point, you're using fewer individuals anyway, and you kind of want to pick the best ones from that population. And then you're moving on, like Michael said, crossing it to something else and getting it uh, to a new population. Um, if, you're, if you're trying to essentially recover a old variety, um, then that's when the population size over several generations will make more of a difference. And um, OSA and Seed Savers Exchange both have really good resources on population sizes for seed saving. Great question about um, effective searching of the GRIN databases. Uh, it could be for Paulina or anyone who's who's got experience with this. Um, they were looking for sweet corn on GRIN, but all they're finding is field corn. Um, any, any tips to get those sweet corns? Um, I have not tried that search, so I don't have any specific tips for that one, but I would say that using the advanced search field um, might get you better results. Um, I know there are places that you can kind of identify exactly which field you're searching. So it could be that like corn is just returning all the results. Um, but Julie, looks like maybe you have a better answer. No, not necessarily. I think sometimes you can do an advanced search and search for certain characteristics. So you might try searching for corn, but then instead of like putting drought tolerance or something in, put sweet in and see if that works. Um, we can also, if that's a specific example, we can kind of do some homework, ask Bill Tracy and get back to people. Um, oftentimes asking someone who's dealt with that crop or works in that crop for tips is the best way because there are, are so many like idiosyncrasies with different crops that it's hard to, hard to guess right sometimes. Right. And um, the other thing I was going to mention is that it does seem that the website is under construction. So I was noticing that even in putting my slides together, that some things aren't working exactly the way I expect them to. Um, and I think that that's probably a temporary thing for now. We're getting close to the end of our time here. There's a few more questions. Michael, there's a question about a, a row seven variety that maybe you could answer in the chat. But another question is about whether it is expected to uh, make a donation or pay for shipping on the grin orders, or is it just completely free? Completely free? Yeah. That's right. Yeah, it's, it's free. Great. Uh, a clarification of, of what does it mean to bulk the seeds of a generation? Hi, Keith, you had your hand up. Yeah, for another reason, but um, that would be to um, grow out a population and select randomly to increase the number of that population. And it goes back to what Julie said about um, retaining the alleles within that population and getting as much diversity kept within that as possible. But it's just uh, creating more seed um, and selecting from everything or the best parents. It just kind of depends about what your goals after. But um, if you're just trying to increase the population and get, get a good representative of that population, save as much as you can from that. 
Yeah, and as you go, you might also find yourself like if you have a whole bunch of different lines that you're evaluating, um, it may be a lot of record keeping. And so you may say, well, I'll put all the red ones together. And so they're from the same cross and then you bulk all the red ones. So you essentially take all of those plants and put them together and say, well, they're similar enough. So I'll just keep track of red. That's later on. We'll probably get into that in later webinars. But for when you're getting new parents and you're essentially, like Keith said, you know, growing them out, seeing what's uniform or not, you may want to bulk the part that's uniform and keep the odd ones separate, or you may want to just keep it all together if it's from an OP. I'll just add to that and say, you know, at the earlier generations, there's a lot more diversity between plants. And so making single plant selections is awful help, often helpful just to make sure that you're capturing whatever you're seeing and you wanna see that in the next generation. As you get um, towards later generations, your material tends to get more uniform. And so there's not as much variation between plants. And so that's where you might bulk several plants that look the same together at a later, later time. I wanted to add something that um, I thought about um, that I didn't say, and that was one of the reasons to access an uh, international resource is you can look at your climate, your zone, whatever you want to call it, um, your geography, and find another part in the world that's similar or maybe a little bit more challenging um, to say, well, what's available from that area that may work in my area? Thank you so much, everybody. We're uh, basically all out of time here. Sorry if your question didn't get answered, but you're always welcome to reach out to any of us to continue the conversation. I'll pass it to Alice, who can wrap us up. Okay, I'd just like to thank everyone for that great discussion and for asking all those questions and for all the presenters for um, sharing your information with us today and also being so active and answering a lot of the questions that came in through the Q&A and the chat. Um, and we hope you join us for the rest of the webinars in this series for in the coming weeks um, at the same time. So um, yeah, we, we hope you can make it for all of them. And if not, um, we are recording them. So they'll be up on the eOrganic YouTube channel within the coming week. And we'll send you the link to um, where you can find the recording as well as to the slides later this afternoon. And we'd very much appreciate it if you could fill out our survey. So thanks everyone. And we hope to see you next week.